All right, cognitive functioning. We can now safely say that exercise over a long period of time is associated with moderate gains in cognitive functioning. And this is very important as our baby boomer population ages and as healthcare professional, you're gonna be dealing with a lot of dementia and Alzheimer's. So it's important to begin to understand this relationship. Acute aerobic exercise appears to increase cognitive functioning in planning and problem solving. And so when we talk about these executive functions, we're talking about functions in the frontal lobe. And that's where we do all of our fancy thinking. So it does appear that uh, exercise, increased cerebral blood flow, increased perfusion, uh, helps particularly in the frontal lobes in the executive functioning. So again, aerobic physical activity, we see some positive effect. Um, executive control is the most affected by aerobic exercise. And there's some evidence out there regarding anaerobic exercise or weightlifting. It's just not, there's just not as much evidence out there, but there is some showing that there is some improvement. Uh, most of this has to do with aerobic. So we see that acute exercise increases cognitive functioning in working memory. And, and that they're stating only in low working memory. Again, this, this particular slideshow was produced. Uh, this information is a little bit old. And so I think that now we have a little bit more evidence to support um, overall improvement in cognitive functioning and memory. But the results are mixed. Still researching. It appears that moderate to physical activity can help with ADHD. And talking about children specifically, it's pretty important to keep kids moving. We've had a shift in the past uh, 20 years, I suppose, to remove recess and physical education from grade school curriculum. Uh, it really kind of started with No Child Left Behind. It was an approach to education that was supposed to ideally bring up our scores in the United States. You know, we're like 17th and 18th in the nation or something for math and science. We're really not number one anymore. And so they thought if we just sat those kids down for longer periods of time to study, it would work. And well, I'll tell you, it didn't work at all. And they stripped out recess. In fact, in Clark County, I think they get some recess before lunch, uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Now I remember as a kid, you know, I had recess. I thought I had recess twice a day plus lunch. Um, and also PE, and uh, you know, we talk about it in class quite a bit, but it's definitely something to keep your eye on. Fortunately now, I think there's a shift back to reality, and therefore our College of Education is implementing a PE teacher curriculum, which does include many of the kinesiology classes, so keep that in mind. Uh, but it, it appears to be very important in the well-being of children, um, and their feeling that they are on purpose and have some motivation to get things done as well as their physical health. Regarding older adults, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, there is plenty of evidence to show that fitness training can help the cognitive functioning of older adults. And again, here we're talking about executive control, that fancy thinking area, the frontal lobes. It appears that fitness can training combined with strength and flexibility have a greater effect on cognition than just aerobics. You need to know that. Take a note. There appears to be a stronger effect in females than in males. Sorry guys, I'm not sure why that is. And as they learn more, maybe they'll figure out why. It appears that exercise should be 30 minutes or longer. And it does appear again that really that cardiovascular benefit, probably that increased circulation, probably that increased you know, perfusion of the, cell, of the brain tissue, of the, of the neurons, that may be what's really helping to protect the brain. And there's enough evidence to show that the people that stay active in, as the, in the old, old, even above 100, you know, gardening, walking, um, any kind of activity really um, is going to help them stay sharp. I have to tell you before I get into this slide, I have an aunt who's 80 years old. And 
I went to Europe with her a couple years ago and I could barely keep up with her. Uh, she just started a yoga practice. Uh, she just wrote her and published her first book. And uh, she just won a couple of awards for short stories and poems. Let's see, what else is she doing? She takes college classes every semester, but she exercises every day. She walks, she does yoga, she goes to other types of fitness classes. And I don't know, I kind of expect to be old with her, um, you know, checking out some sort of new fitness trend. So I've seen it work and I've seen it work the other way too. There's a lot of reports that exercise can help you sleep, but it's not really strong enough exercise, strong enough evidence, excuse me, to, to report for all people. So they're pretty small effect sizes, but enough to keep researching. It does seem to produce small increases in total sleep time. For me, I know I sleep better when I've exercised. Um, so maybe that's a personal, it's a, you know, person to person individualized thing. So quality of life, really the overall um, behavioral functioning ability to do your stuff and enjoy it. Well, physically active people like my aunt report a better quality of life. So talking about runner's high, uh, if you've ever had it, it's pretty cool. I mean, you definitely feel um, out of body, sort of maybe at a higher level of consciousness or being. Usually unexpected. Um, it, it's really kind of a transcendent experience. And a lot of research has gone into this, but it does appear that this uh, is related to some type of chemical change on the endorphins. And it doesn't have to just be running. Really, any kind of extreme activity uh, is, is, is beneficial. It can result in runner's high or flow state. So few distractions, cool, calm weather for runners, low humidity, you know, some things that are not making it <laughs> worse, <laughs> worse than the actual exercise, right? If it's 110 degrees out, you may not reach that flow state. And, you know, everybody's different. I have never gotten runner's high from running. I've gotten it from other types of activities. Uh, and the, the scientist is Chick Sent Me High, which I think is a really cool name, who termed this flow state. So again, I mentioned earlier in the lecture, there's a really great book called uh, Rise to Superman. And I don't have the author off the tip of my brain, but you can find it on Amazon. And it talks about extreme athletes, particularly snowboarders and, uh, yeah, X Games and their reports of flow state. And it's pretty interesting. Um, I've talked with many fighters who experience this. So isn't just running. Flow state's not just for runners anymore. All right, talking about mirrors and exercise settings. So this is probably nothing you, you probably never thought about this. Although I think I saw some, some discussion in the Facebook, uh, Facebook groups. So if there are mirrors in the exercise class. It really depends on the person. So if you've got a 50 year old woman who's sedentary, maybe has gained a lot of weight, um, has a poor perception of self, if they're in front of a mirror, what they're going to do is pick themselves apart. Now, maybe it's even just a, a young man. It could be anybody. If you've ever done that in an exercise class where instead of like focusing on the exercise or the enjoyment or the sensations in your body or anything else you're too busy staring yourself down and saying nasty things to yourself which probably isn't gonna increase the you know the enjoyment of the activity so remember that if you've got women in this age particularly women but it certainly doesn't have to just be women that maybe not exercising in front of the mirror for for a while is better right maybe maybe just avoiding that mirror in the beginning I know as a yoga instructor, when I have a new student come in and who fits that description, typically it could be men or women, maybe overweight or obese, probably sedentary, and man, they don't want to be in front of that mirror. And, you know, if they can get out of view, they will. And I've tried to say, hey, you know, the mirror will help you with your form and, and they don't want to. So I just leave them alone. And I think that the greatest feeling is when you see that person start to scoot into, you know, up closer so they can see the mirror, they start to use the mirror in their exercise. And I think that's, you know, really uh, an improvement. 
But keep that in mind, please. Now, in these uh, in this research, you know, people that felt more self-confident didn't have that same effect. But it may not be something you'd think about because maybe you've never experienced that. We're always trying to promote exercise, but remember, it doesn't work for everybody. And stay in your scope unless you get another degree in psychology or unless you're working in a partnership with a trained psychologist, which, hey, by the way, consider that as an entrepreneurial idea. Uh, just remember that um, refer, refer, refer to other professionals that you respect because this might not be the effective treatment for each and every person. So when you're writing an exercise prescription, and you're going to have some questions on this, so pay attention. Um, explore the client's exercise history. You might have somebody, if you're, let's just assume that you're a personal trainer. And you get somebody who's 48 years old. And he's a guy, and he played, he played uh, college football. And so he worked out a lot, right? And then after college, right, he maybe got a job and had some kids and um, didn't exercise anymore the way he used to. And so he thinks that the only way to exercise is the training he did in college. And the fact that he can't do that anymore kind of makes him not try at all. So that would be a very special case, and it would be important for you to know that. My mother is um, almost 80, and she never exercised in her entire life. Uh, it was just not something that women were told to do. You saw the video on Catherine Switzer, and women were not expected to or invited to exercise. In fact, being sweaty was kind of gross. And so my mother was never primed to exercise. And when she was in her 70s, she began to develop metabolic disorder or prediabetes. And she has this wonderful boyfriend who's adorable and wears a bow tie and sings while she plays the piano. And he got her involved in water aerobics. So my mother now goes to water aerobics twice a week. She no longer has metabolic disorder. And my mother has mental illness. And I can tell the difference in her ability to communicate. I've actually had reasonable conversations with my mother since she started doing water aerobics. Now, I don't know how much exercise she's actually getting. I think a lot of it is the socialization. I think she's kind of splashing around with her friends because I go, I go watch her do her water aerobics when I go visit, but I've seen it. And so these are the kinds of things like history of exercise. Think of asking questions so you know who you're dealing with. Don't assume that their exposure to exercise is the same as yours. It's very important to use an individualized exercise prescription. What kinds of things do they like to do? What time of day do they like to exercise? And we'll get into this even more when we talk about exercise adherence. Think of all of the things that would individualize an exercise prescription. Uh, evaluate influence of family and friends. And this can be very important. We'll talk about it more in exercise adherence. Plan for any kind of irregular pattern of exercise, whether it be to, uh, you know, an illness or maybe um, a vacation. And, hey, if you can include some type of, like, walking the dog, riding your bike to work, uh, you know, gardening, it might actually make, uh, make it better. And, again, if somebody is experiencing mental health disorders, encourage exercise as an adjunct uh, please don't ever tell people to take to get off their meds. Um, if somebody's taking anti-anxiety medication and some antidepressant medications, um, stopping cold turkey is not an option. You know, I had a friend who tried to quit taking a prescribed Xanax after a period of 10 years. She decided to go cold turkey after doing yoga for a while, and she ended up in the emergency room having a psychotic break. So, and it was because she went cold turkey. So please be responsible, uh, regardless of your personal ideas or biases, to always support your, your clients and your patients. Make sure to include all kinds of activities. And you will be a qualified professional. There's no exact criteria. And maybe this is an area you could work. There's going to be a lot of need. There is now. So you will need the education you're getting in order to be the very best possible exercise professional that can help people 
treat and prevent mental illness. Always remember, if you ever need to talk, I'm always around. I'm not going anywhere as far as I know. All right.